in this smarter second generation guise. It's now a little bigger, but as before, it's a Clio based design offering super economical engines, some genuinely clever interior touches, and no small dose of style. It'll appeal to super mini buyers wanting extra versatility as well as family hatchback customers in search of something more interesting and affordable. And it's the kind of car that'll certainly drive sales in this segment. The original capture hailed from an era where no one really expected a small SUV to handle with any real sense of driver engagement. But things have been changing in recent times and this Renault has tried to change with them. Now that might explain why the suspension doesn't have the same kind of uh, fluid feel that we remember from the original version of this car. But on the plus side, uh, thanks to revised electric steering and a more sophisticated CMFB platform, there's now much more of a purpose to the way that this little crossover turns into the bends. And there's a level of body control that certainly wasn't there before. Engine-wise, uh, most will be choosing between the two mainstream petrol engines, either a three-cylinder, one-litre TCE 100 entry-level unit mated to a five-speed manual gearbox, or the four-cylinder 1.3-litre TCE 130 power plant we're trying here, which can be had either with a six-speed manual gearbox or with a seven-speed EDC automatic transmission. With the EDC box, it manages WLTP rated figures of up to 44.8 mpg and up to 141 grams per kilometer. And the same engine can be had in an uprated TCE 155 state of tune, uh, where it's only mated to EDC automatic transmission. For the few who still might want a diesel in this class of car, uh, Renault continues to offer its 1.5 litre four cylinder DCI unit in 95 or 115 HP forms, the latter with the option of EDC auto transmission as an alternative to the standard six speed manual. Alternatively, you can ask your dealer about an E-Tech petrol plug-in hybrid variant that mates a 1.6 litre petrol engine to a clever multi-mode auto gearbox and a pair of electric motors powered by a 9.8 kilowatt hour, 400 volt lithium ion battery. Uh, this allows for a WLTP rated all electric driving range of up to 30 miles, plus there's a WLTP CO2 reading of just 33 grams per kilometre and the car can be recharged a Type 2 Mode 3 cable in just three hours. Whatever power plant you select for your capture, refinement is excellent by segment standards, uh, very nearly class leading, which is enough to make this run a, a more pleasurable companion on the kind of longer journey that you might normally expect to find a touch wearing in a small car like this. This second generation model's predecessor offered a template for the way a crossover of this kind should look. Uh, this is one of the first cars in the sector, for example, to feature the styling device that designers call a floating roof. Uh, this has been retained here, of course, as part of a car that has now become significantly bigger, 110 millimeters longer, 19 mils wider, and 17 millimeters taller than before. Arguably, even more has changed from a frontal perspective. Full LED headlights uh, are standard and look particularly striking when, on a top model like this one, they're surrounded by Renault's trademark C-shaped daytime running light signature. At the rear, the flush-fitting hatch has slim LED taillights intended to emphasize body width with C-shaped illuminating 3D signatures. Good enough, so we have an evolution in styling and a revolution in structural engineering. Which of these approaches is gonna dominate inside? Time to take a look up front. Well, it's certainly a big step forward from what was offered before. That slight whiff of second-class citizenship that was delivered by the cabin of the previous capture has been well and truly banished here in favour of soft-touch trimming, tactile touch points, and a distinctly Audi-esque feel to parts of this completely revitalised design, particularly the circular ventilation dials uh, that sit midway down the centre stack, smart piano key switches featured just above, plus various satin finished silver embellishments and the redesigned more enveloping seats both also play their part in helping to push this car a little more upmarket. Uh, this cabin does still lack the sheer solidity of a Volkswagen Group product in this segment, but jump out of a Ford Puma or perhaps something Korean into one of these and you might feel like you've been upgraded to business class.
Uh, various screens help, of course, with a whole more sophisticated demeanor, uh, particularly this, uh, the central EasyLink portrait display. It's available in either 7-inch or, as in this case, 9.3-inch forms. You can also view another screen through the uh, redesigned three-spoke steering wheel here. Uh, plusher variants, they get this 7-inch TFT configurable instrument display, which at the top of the range uh, can also be upgraded to a wider 10-inch monitor if you'd like. Okay, let's take a seat in the back. It actually feels very decently spacious back here by class standards. Uh, rear legroom's been improved by 17 millimeters, and that's thanks in part to redesigned front seats uh, that also feature these curiously angled comma-shaped headrests. They're apparently designed to improve frontward visibility for rear seat occupants. The original Capture was the first car in the class to offer a sliding rear bench, a feature copied since in the small SUV segment only by the Volkswagen T-Cross. And it's still one of the things that we think family folk will like most about this Renault. We'll finish with a look at cargo space. Now this is increased by a useful 81 litres to as much as 536 litres this time around, although that's with the rear bench slid all the way forward, crushing adult knees against the front seat backs. This useful lower pull lever allows you to yank it back and with the bench pulled right back towards you, the boot space falls to um, 422 litres in size. It's still pretty reasonable by class standards. Unlike in a Clio, you get an adjustable height boot floor, so this is at least a really flexible space. Uh, set the uh, luggage board at its lowest position, and there's room for really quite tall items. Uh, one day, we will come across a small SUV fitted with a properly flexible 40-20-40 split backrest, but that day hasn't come yet, so this capture gets the usual 60-40 split affair, which, when it's pushed forward, frees up 1,275 litres of capacity across an almost flat load floor of 1.57 metres. That's 110 mils more than the previous model could offer. Historically, in our market, the Capture has never sold quite as well as it does in continental Europe. But such is the step forward represented by this Mark II model that we think there's scope for that to change. Now, true, this Capture does face strong competition from a growing band of very talented rivals. But it's a model that you have to consider before buying any one of them. A uh, cleverer crossover. If you really want a car of this kind, then you'll really want to try this.